Greetings. It's good to be here with you uh, again. This is a weekly habit, it seems. And I uh, thank you so much for inviting me into your homes, your places, as you listen or watch, in whatever way you do. I want to begin by asking you a question. How would you define the expression, the idiom, true grit? The idiom, true grit. FreeDictionary.com defines true grit as true resolve, uh, strength of character, determination. Dictionary.com uh, defines the word grit in a number of ways, but in one sense, grit is defined as firmness of character or an indomitable spirit. Other words for grit could be courage, could be resilience, could be determination. Going back uh, to 2016, uh, Michigan State University published an article asking the question, what does it mean to have grit? The article cited other sources, and one such source proposed that uh, there are five characteristics of a, someone who possesses grit. And in no particular order, the, they go as follows. Courage, thoroughness, follow through, res resilience, uh, excellence versus perfection. We go back further in time to the year 1969. And we see that Paramount Pictures in the early June of that year released the movie True Grit. This is uh, starring John Wayne and Glenn Campbell. And this was the story of a young woman seeking justice for the murder of her father uh, by a hired hen. And she had heard that U.S. Marshal Eugene uh, Rooster J. Cogburn possessed true grit. True grit. So she hires the aging marshal to track, capture, and bring to justice her father's killer. Well, to make a long story short, through all kinds of adversity, this young woman in the end reveals her true grit, reveals her strength of character, her courage, her follow-through, and her resilience. When we consider the Bible, it's interesting to note that you will not find the word grit anywhere in a good, reliable translation of the Bible. Bloom, John Bloom, in his article, True Grit, keeping with the theme, agrees that the word grit is nowhere found in the Bible, but did say in his article, quote, it is there nonetheless. And then Bloom correctly defines grit biblical grit as steadfastness and endurance. And these words you will find in the Bible. Bloom would suggest that this is the determination to stay at it, whatever it is, no matter what may come, and the determination to keep moving forward despite the adversity surrounding you or me and the internal weaknesses that we have. And Bloom then provides in his article a number of what he calls gritty examples in the Bible. And just to mention a few, we, we find Abraham and Sarah who had moved away from everyone and everything that they had known and waited 25 years well into their old age for the fulfillment of God's promised son, Isaac. And then there was Joseph in Egyptian prison, him as well, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise. And Bloom uh, accurately, at least, or at least I think uh, accurately, well, Bloom wraps up his list with Jesus who faced the horror that only God could face and moved with relentless determination to the cross. And then Bloom asks the important question, what is biblical grit? And he provides and offers an answer. Quote, Biblical grit differs from worldly, pull-up-your-bootstrap variety grit. Biblical steadfastness and endurance have at their core the promise of God. Biblical grit is empowered by God's grace. End quote. Well, the next logical question to ask then is, what produces biblical grit? 
What produces biblical grit? Is it uh, something you could earn at a college, a degree in true grit? Is it a genetic trait that you're born with? You have grit in your genes? Or is it an acquired trait? Well, Bloom suggests the latter and would say, quote, true grit is forged in the fires of adversity. Forged in the fires of adversity. Well, friends, please turn to 1 Timothy. Uh, we will be con concluding the first chapter uh, this week. It's been a four or five week journey to get to the end of first chapter. But please read with me 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Verse 18. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well, holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwrecked with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. As we turn our, our minds and our hearts and our attention to your word, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you illuminate our minds and hearts, that you would help us understand and know the message that you have for us today. And then from there, we ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would help us and lead us to put it into practice in our daily lives and in our work lives and everywhere that we engage other people with. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. There once was a Christian who described his, his suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The saint was imprisoned, beaten, whipped, exposed to the elements, was hated by many, was prosecuted by others, was verbally insulted, at times went hungry and thirsty for extended periods of time, had to work hard just to keep the lights on, and as a spiritual leader, uh, carried the burden day and night for the brothers and sisters under their care, in the end, was killed for the gospel. Another time, another place, there was a Christian faced with a decision that would change the course of their life. This Christian was living under a tyrannical government who was imprisoning any opposition, political or otherwise, and, and murdering many for their cause. This Christian would not compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the result was this person would have to go underground and to continue to care and support other brothers and sisters in that way. This Christian was banned from any public appearance and eventually was arrested and imprisoned, in the end was killed for the gospel. Adversity. No one likes it. No one wants it. No one prays for it. No one, most people run from it. And when one is in the midst of hardship, the only thought is to get out of it ASAP. Well, considering the context of 1 Timothy, uh, we know that Paul was writing to encourage and command Timothy to deal with adversity in the Ephesian church. As we have already learned over the past weeks, some were teaching, as Paul called, another gospel. They were adding to the gospel. It was Jesus plus something. And they were doing this by teaching these myths and genealogies and all sorts of religious rules that really had nothing to do with salvation they had received by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And this was causing a ruckus, folks. It was causing a ruckus, causing some to question their faith, some even to abandon their faith, causing division and misunderstanding and inappropriate worship of God. So serious was the situation that our text today tells us that some in the Ephesian church had what? Shipwrecked their faith. That is, they destroyed. That's what this, this metaphor is. They destroyed their faith, as we read of a couple of those in the text. 
Matter of fact, in Paul's letter to Timothy, his second letter, this, this false teaching, if it, was not to be, if it was not dealt with soon enough, would spread like gangrene. Spread like gangrene. So what was Timothy to do? Quit, give in to it, or face adversity head on? Can I ask, how about you? When you are faced with adversity, what do you do? Do you quit? Do you give in? Do you face it heads on? See, I'm not trying to be trite here, folks. Truth be told, we, ha- we all have had to answer these questions one time or another, or many times in our lives, and we'll do so again. Well, please notice with me here in verse 18, the phrase, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command. What command? Well, it's the command that we learned of in verse 3 of this chapter, where Paul said, as I urged you when you went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Now, if you remember, the word command is a military word. So this sense here is that of a superior officer giving a command to a subordinate. Next, please notice with me the phrase, in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. And let's not get focused on the word prophecies here. Uh, At this time, one can only really speculate Thus, we need to keep to the point of this particular passage. Paul was reminding Timothy of God's calling on his life. And this is how we should see this phrase, the prophecies once made about you. The instructions that Paul had given to Paul in verse 3 and following, uh, given to Timothy, pardon me, for the church in Ephesus, was part and parcel with God calling Timothy or as we would say today, ordaining Timothy for ministry. And this would include all the gifts that God had given to Timothy to do the work of the ministry he was called to. Folks, God called Timothy, not Paul. God's calling on Timothy was for God's purposes, not Paul's. And of course, Paul demonstrates here that he knows that. And this begs the question for you. Your calling is from God not from someone else. Keep that in mind. Next, we have the conjunction, so that. So to paraphrase Paul, in essence, what he was saying here, Timothy, now that you remember why you are in Ephesus, keep doing God's work. In other words, uh, fight the battle well. Paul said to Timothy later on in the letter, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many. Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, was writing from Roman prison and awaiting his execution. And if anybody knew what it meant to fight the good fight of the faith, Paul certainly would have. And here in that letter, he tells Timothy that I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Did you know, folks, that the Christian life is a race? It is a race. Question is, what kind of race is it? Is it a sprint? Is it the 100-yard dash? I mean, a 400-meter race at the Olympics? Or is it a marathon? Well, short answer. I think we all understand this. It's a lifelong marathon. If you are a follower of Christ, a true believer, it's a lifelong marathon. So the question is, how are you doing in your race. What adversity are you facing today? Consider with me those who run ultra marathons, you know, the 100 milers. I think that's just absolutely crazy. I run, but I can't even imagine myself running 100 miles in one day. And it is that reasonable and log- logic to consider that their bodies are potentially fa- facing some serious adversary, adversity. And I found one website that that really does a good job of breaking down the body, uh, starting with the brain, and the potential impact of running 100 miles in one day on the human body. 
Uh, just keep it brief, for example, the potential impact on the brain can include um, heat stroke, hallucinations from fatigue, and something that I've never heard of before um, called central, fat central fatigue. And this is where there is a gradual decline in the nervous system's ability to contract muscles. Now that would really come into play when you're running a 100 mile marathon. I think a really important organ to consider if you run anywhere, but certainly a 100 mile marathon, is the heart. And two things will likely happen when you run a 100 mile marathon. Maybe both, but two things for sure will happen. The heart will either increase or decrease in rate. So an increased heart rate occurs when the amount of blood volume pumped by each heartbeat uh, may be declining thus causing the heart to beat faster to keep up with the needed volume. A decreased heart rate results when the muscular system becomes fatigued, and boy, that should in a 100 mile race, and no longer demands the blood from the heart. And we could go on through, you know, the, the rest of the body, the arms, the legs, the hands, the, the GI tract, but here's the point. Athletes who run a 100 mile marathon well, without a doubt, face adversity with every step they take. And here's the metaphor. As a follower of Christ, you will face adversity in your lifelong Christian marathon. You can count on it. The question remains, what will you do when adversity comes your way or shows up in your doorstep? And come it will. Are you going to quit? Are you going to give in? Are you going to face adversity heads on? C.S. Lewis once said, in our adversity, God shouts at us. God shouts at us. Keep that in mind. Well, folks, when we consider the adversity that Timothy had to face in the Ephesian church, I'm not sure that many would jump up and say, pick me, pick me. And while we don't know, only one, one can only imagine that Timothy may have had a moment or two when he must have thought there must be another way. But hence, Paul reminding Timothy in this letter that God called him, and that calling came along with adversity. He would really be succinct in his second letter to Timothy, where he said, Join with me to Timothy in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, before we lose some focus here, you and I, all believers, are called by God to serve. We already learned this. We're, we already understood this in this series, that all believers are saved to serve Christ and others. And friends, when one serves Christ faithfully, you will face adversity. Jesus even said so. And where Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master, and if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Friends, this is what all true believers face. See, it's a spiritual warfare, folks, and the enemy does not play fair. There will be no truths, there will be no peace, no R and R until Jesus returns. All believers, each and every one, are spiritual soldiers who are commanded by the Lord of hosts out into the battleground. The question is, will you quit, will you give in, or will you face the adversity? When we consider the weapons God has given the believer to fight the good fight, let's do so in the, mind, in the context of this particular letter that Paul wrote. We see what the false teachers had in their tool pouch, their toolbox, and they had controversial speculations to, to, to deal out. They had meaningless talk. We see these, all, these are all uh, quotes from Paul's letters. Interested, they were only interested in controversies and, and quarrels about words. They, they, they were just chattering, chattering, chattering along godlessly. They were foolish, and they had stupid arguments. And some, I think, and, and I see this to be a reality in our time as well, that the best tragedy, the uh, best way to deal with this in these cases is to use logic and reason and clever argument in return. But Paul here exhorts Timothy to avoid such things. 
we also, I think, would be wise to do so. So what was Paul to do? What about you and me today? Well, the only weapon Timothy had, and the only weapon we truly all have as followers of Christ, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Paul even said it, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And as followers of Jesus Christ, our main concern must be the spiritual condition of those who bring adversity into our lives. No matter who they are, what they believe, how they live, their lives. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is, as Paul said to the Roman church, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. This is the weapon that God has given us as followers of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul encouraged Timothy in, in, in dealing with the false teachers in Ephesus by teaching sound biblical instruction, sound biblical doctrine, to correct any potential flawed views and to call each and every one to repentance. You see, the aim, my friends, was to protect the faith of those the false teachers were reaching out to and to win any of them back who had strayed. No man's left behind. No man or woman is left behind, if at all possible. And also, Paul in this text reveals and explains really to us today that there were dangers to this, dangers to to, to consider as a soldier of Christ. Where he said to Timothy, the second half of the one sentence there from 18 to 19, holding on to faith and a good conscience which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to faith. Paul here qualifies the command that he has in verse 18 by pointing to a believer's um, spiritual condition. And this is this phrase, holding on to faith in a good conscience. See, believers are engaged in spiritual warfare and the supernatural powers of Satan, deception and persuasion must not be taken lightly. Therefore, like an ultramarathoner whose training regime includes every area, the believer must train likewise. And Paul here presents a spiritual life from two perspectives from two, two points of view, faith and a good conscience. And may I say that both faith and a good conscience should not be seen as separate from each other. They are two peas in the same pod. Or as one commentator put it, the purity of one's faith is directly related to the effectiveness of one's conscience. So what is conscience? Well, literally, it's defined as a knowing with. Friends, this is the internal witness regarding your conduct and my conduct. For a believer, it's the ability to understand God's will. God's will that governs our lives. The ability to distinguish uh, what is God's moral goodness and what is morally bad. The conscience Therefore, prompts you and me to do the good and stay away from the bad. Then, how does our faith work with our conscience? Well, according to Paul, if one rejects, as some had in Ephesus, a good conscience, they will what? Suffer shipwreck. In other words, they will destroy their faith. Calvin once said, quote, a bad conscience is the mother of all heresies. Let's make this personal. Did you know your conscience can be silenced? Your conscience can become mute. You can't hear it anymore. And the more you, you go against the prompting of your conscience, the more your behavior will be impacted. When we consider this in Timothy's uh, cultural context, and let's consider it in ours as well, because there's not much different there, really. We find a profane culture, a profane culture, antichrist, opposed to God's design for men and women, self-centered ethics, 
denial of sinful nature of humanity. They psychologized it away. Empty human philosophies and much more that opposes the will of God. And it's no wonder the conscience can be silenced. It can be closed for business. We can understand the conscience really in this way as an early warning device or indication. That's a better way of seeing it, indication. Just like the warning light in your vehicle when you are driving down the road. The light warns you when it comes on to check something. So what do you do with it? Do you check it out or do you ignore it? Then what happens if it goes off as you're driving and then comes on again a couple of minutes later? What do you do? Do you ignore it? Do you check it out? Friends, this reminds us that we can't depend only on our conscience. Our spiritual lives only work when our faith and our conscience are working together. They're in sync with each other. We ignore the warning light at our peril, and if our faith is not, as Paul would describe it, sincere, and our hearts are not pure, then our conscience will not be good. It, they work together, folks. And the only weapon, as we come to a close here, that any believer has to deal with false teachers, false teaching, a profane culture, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as successful ultramarathoners ultra who train and prepare, their, prepare for their race, you and I build and strengthen our faith and our conscience by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, by keeping it pure, and checking everything with the master manual, the Bible, the Holy Bible, keeping short accounts with God, and pursuing, as we read in the letter here, righteousness and godliness and faith and love, endurance and gentleness. C.S. Lewis said, in our adversity, God shouts to us, and friends, if we listen, it will produce true grit. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who is abiding with us. And thank you between the Holy Spirit and your word. We can have a good conscience and we can have a pure and sincere faith. And Lord, thank you so much that you go... Uh, ahead of us and you protect us as we lean and trust into your one and only gospel, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me. Shalom.